Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar today from Michigan and Karmasek. Today, we have a really, really special guest today, Kevin Clough, um, Senior Solution Architect from Karmasek. Um, and today, we'll be talking about requirements for a secure cloud lifecycle. And as you probably know, that cloud security is a really, really important topic these days, where you, as a cloud customers, are required to ensure that your cloud is going to be secure compliant, also resilient. And it is basically your job, basically, to ensure that to safeguard all your sensitive data and maintaining integrity of all of digital operations happening on your cloud. But the thing is that ensuring the lifecycle itself, making sure that from the pipeline or also like whatever happening as well on the infrastructure level is not as easy as that. And today that Kevin will share his experiences basically as a senior sales and architect as well to tell you as well how you as a cloud customer can also achieve a secure cloud security lifecycle in this regards. So Kevin, then I hand over to you. We can start the webinar now. Thanks, Isan. Thanks for having, having me. And uh, I think I will uh, start sharing my, my screen um, and we can start right now i think okay um thank you for joining all um and uh, today we are talking about the requirements for secure cloud lifecycle. um there are several things uh, i have to say um about C um, cloud itself because it's different than on premise and data center and office it and all the other stuff you have to secure in your company and um Today, we are uh, going to have the four phases of a uh, secure cloud lifecycle. Then we have some prerequisites, and then I uh, describe the phases in detail. Uh, but before I, um, I will do that, uh, let me talk a little bit about the KarmaSec, because um, KarmaSec, we are specialized in security um, consultancy we are um, from management uh, consulting so governance risk and compliance topics to technical topics like cloud um, security and we have over 30 years of experience we have more than 100 successful projects and we are a growing team and now about i think the number is outdated we are about uh, more than 30 people on our team right now um, Let's get over to the first description. The four phases. I divided the four phases for the cloud lifecycle in the design, build, and run and optimize um, phases. I will describe later on what to do in these single phases and what uh, we have to um, accomplish. And before we go to the next uh, step for building uh, a cloud infrastructure or a cloud ecosystem for your company um, but we have as I mentioned before some prerequisites and these prerequisites uh, you have you wonder um the prerequisites the design phase are more are much more bigger than the builds and the run and the optimize phase because if you do your hard heavy lifting up front um, you have a easier life running and uh, optimizing your cloud infrastructure for your company um, as well. So let me start. The first prerequisite is organizational readiness. What do I, you can see it. Okay, no, let me, yes. Um, the orga organizational readiness. Um, upfront, you have some questions to answer yourself. For example, do you, uh, do you um, have any regulatory requirements which you have to fulfill? Uh, there are some data privacy concerns in your company. Have you talked to every stakeholder about these requirements? Do you see or know how to do a cloud government, uh, cloud governments, and and stuff like that? These are essential to answer these questions before you move on to um, to the cloud. The next step as well is very important because are the skills and the know-how in your company existent? Do you have, for example, cloud engineers? Do you have site reliable engineers if you have workloads in, in, your, in your cloud? Do you have 
cloud security um, personnel because, as I mentioned before, cloud security is totally different from on-prem or office IT security. You, we don't talk about directly about endpoint protection, like antivirus and stuff like that. We are talking more about uh, bigger pictures and 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 zero trust and landing zones and and stuff like that. And then, of course, I come to this point later uh, again. DevOps. Do you have knowledge for DevOps and building pipelines? I can I can explain later on why this is so important, especially in the cloud security uh, sector. And then have you use cases and requirements ready for your transition to or migration to the cloud? Have you your functional use cases and uh, of course very important non-functional um, requirements or use cases ready because non-functional requirements are these which count most in, in security and cloud security then we have more um the shared responsibility model i hope everyone heard about the shared responsibility model because you don't operate your own data center anymore it is in the responsibility of a cloud service provider if you want to choose the public cloud, you have to do um, the insights in the shared responsibility model. What are your, yeah, what are you responsible for? And what is the cloud service provider responsible for? And you have to sort it out really carefully because you have infrastructure as a service, you have platform as a service, you have even soft, um, software and function as a service, and the responsibilities shift uh, um, a lot between these stages. Then we have the threat model and risk assessment. Do you know the threats if you migrate to a public cloud, for example? Have you uh, done an initial risk assessment that you know all your risk which potentially can happen to your infrastructure, to your data, or to your workloads when you migrate, uh, migrate to um, the cloud. I'm talking here about uh, Stride, for example, that you have a really detailed threat model before you're migrating to, to the cloud environment. Then, very important, and uh, I can tell a, a little story. Um, some customer wanted to move to cloud I had, had last year, and they didn't do this step. They didn't map out the existing inf infrastructure, and they ran into limitations with the cloud service provider. They want to build a um, very sophisticated network infrastructure, but there were hard limits at the cloud service provider's uh, side, though they couldn't do all the, what they wanted because the maximum numbers of subnets were reached and they had to again talk to the cloud service provider and increase this number because um, the existing infrastructure they had wouldn't map to the new infrastructure the greenfield cloud they are doing then the last but not less important step is um, the cloud service provider selection and I talked about public cloud, but this is not limited to public cloud. You have also the model of a private cloud. Do you, you also have the opportunity to do a hybrid cloud where you are keeping your data center and only migrating some workloads or cloud-ready workloads really to the cloud. When I talk about cloud-ready workloads, I'm mainly talking about cloud native stuff like containerized in Kubernetes operating workloads. But um, you have different options here to do before you even go to the to the cloud. And um, that brings me to the first phase, um, the design phase of our fourth phase or four step um, way for a secure cl cloud lifecycle. Um, we have to talk about Cloud Foundation. If there are any questions around Cloud Foundation, uh, please paste it in the in the chat. I have um, a rough summarization, explanation to, uh, to the Cloud Foundation. Um, it's the central piece of cloud strategy. Um, as you as an organization have to 
do all these steps for the Cloud Foundation. That means um, which operating model do you use? Which um, goal is it to pr provide all your workloads in the cloud? Do you have your in internal programs and software and workloads in the cloud or only external? And there are a lot of uh, things to consider. And one step of the Cloud Foundation is the architecture concept. And the architecture concept includes the infrastructure as I told, the workloads, and of course, the security. Um, I will further uh, deep dive right now in, uh, in the next steps um, because these are more technical, but all belong to the Cloud Foundation. First, we have, have the identity and access management. You have different layers of identity and access management and a lot of cloud stuff or cloud security circles around identity and access management. Um, you have big providers like like Entra ID from Microsoft or um, how's it called? Um, I'm not sure. The other one uh, big and um, these concepts um, for identity and access management also um, have the layers of cloud service provider access. So which people in your organization should have access to the cloud service provider itself, to the structure, to the account structure, and so on. So on. Then if you have customer facing workloads, you have an identity and access management to provide in the cloud or around the cloud for your customers. And of course, the employees like cloud engineers, DevOps, um, how do they get to the resources they need and how you provide um, them with access and prohib prohibit access where they don't belong. Then we have the big topic of, uh, of observability. This is on the one hand, observability in security context and in the functional context of your workloads. So you need to consider logging, monitoring, tracing, and profiling for um, these observability stacks. On the one hand, um, if you want to know, you want to get alarmed if your business case as your workload um, running in the cloud is working correctly or is not working correctly. And on the other hand, the observability can also teach the security people a lot insights in the stuff running in the cloud because you can observe all things happen right or wrong um, for your workloads. So, for example, you have um, a virtual machine running an any service uh, cloud service provider, and the normal load is around. 50% CPU usage and uh, I don't know 50% of RAM usage uh, on a normal day, but some some day it spikes up a lot, and um, there's going on processes and and stuff like that. And then you can maybe think, um, maybe something is wrong here. And I've seen cases uh, in the last years where crypto miners were installed on virtual machines. Uh, in the cloud on, on a customer side, and they peaked out the CPU usage, the RAM usage, and produces cost for the for the customer. And um, with the right observability tool, we could have detected it, but we detected it at the end of the month when the bill hits. And then the last big part of the cloud foundation is the Tom, the technical operating model. He can go different routes. Um, I'm maybe starting from the top. You have a centralized approach and a decentralized approach for your technical operating model. Um, you have to think about your security cloud team, network team, identity access management team, all the teams you have there. Um, in the centralized approach, there's a core infrastructure you provide um, for all your users inside the company. So all your uh, product teams and, and DevOps teams and a central team manages all the core infrastructure and provides access to them from a centralized place to all your internal customers. 
this had uh, several advantages because you can reduce the amount of people working on the infrastructure and uh, on the on the cloud um, itself um, and we have a central place where all alerts and dumb things going, uh, going wrong um, appear uh, and they can solve it um, the downside is if you have a small teams or you scaled not well enough your teams you have a bottleneck there on the other side we have the decentralized approach there is then a very small team operating the cloud infrastructure and every team using the cloud infrastructure like devops teams or product teams have to do all this on on their own so basically they have to have an own security team, an own cloud team, and uh, own network team, because they have to do all that on their own. You can increase the speed by that, but you have to have more personal knowing what to do in, um, in the case something goes wrong. After the design phase, we are going to the build phase. And this is the uh, realized extremely heavy on uh, the design phase, of course. Um, we have to talk first about uh, secure software development lifecycle, because um, this is kind of the way or the best practice at the moment, I would say, um, to provide cloud infrastructure, because you don't only develop workloads and software for your customers in such a way, you also do your infrastructure. And we're talking here about immutable infrastructure. Um, that means you're building your infrastructure from code. So I hope everyone heard about Terraform or the Open Tofu project right now. Um, so you can build your complete infrastructure in code and run it to a uh, pipeline and then have a deployed infrastructure then. The benefits doing that is you have directly a code base which reflects the infrastructure. And if you version your code, you have a versioned infrastructure. You can go steps back if something happens to your infrastructure, or you can redeploy in a different account or a different um, organizational structure, your whole infrastructure. And there are some other advantages because this is a pipeline basically. What you can do in a pipeline, you can add additional steps like configuration checks. So you define your infrastructure in code so you can scan this code for misconfigurations directly in the, co in the code before deploying to infrastructure. And um, especially the Terraform Cloud, but there are also open source providers doing that. Um, you can write your policies as code, though if you have uh, a governance and a compliance and um, there are strict policies uh, for your cloud infrastructure, you can write this also in code and check this policy as code against your infrastructure code, um, which are, is highly beneficial because you don't deploy policy uh, violations directly to your infrastructure. You can stop it before it's deployed even. Then the run phase or the one run step. Um, it's about running and operating the cloud. So you have to clear all the upfront questions like the regulatory requirements. You have to design and make the concepts and then write it all in infrastructure, have checks uh, against your code and your policy and, and stuff like that. And now you have a running cloud there. And now you have to do actively things in the cloud infrastructure. And we're talking exactly here about the patch management, so observability stack and the security processes. Um, patch management uh, in the cloud native approach um, a lot of people say or think patch management it's for OS's and server and stuff like that but it's not only that you only have also have patches for container images or um, you have al also running maybe 
not directly if you're using a service, but you can have running your own Kubernetes cluster. And there's an operating system underlying that. And this needs to be patched and, um, and checked uh, always against the actual, I would say, um, actual patch stand at the moment. Then the observability stack. We uh, talked about the observability stack. You have to make sure that everything is connected to the observability stack. If you have the nice and fancy tools laying around or standing around and nothing is plugged in there and there are no rules and no lots configured, it, it's worthless. And then a um, really hard step because a lot of customers are having problems with that um, is implementing security processes. They are thinking you have to implement it on the technical level. But it's not always the case. You have to um, implement the security process. You can also do it on the organizational level. So if you have policies in place, like, for example, a joiner, mover, and lever process, it's nothing you can do directly technical to it. You have to follow an instruction set uh, which is written at your company. Then we have the security operation. Um, of course, because we are talking about secure code, uh, secure cloud lifecycle. So we have vulnerability management, threat hunting, incident response, disaster recovery, and business continuity management. Um, disaster recovery and business continuity management, uh, I, I will start with that because if you decide for a public cloud, it's much more easy because disaster recovery and business continuity management can be done by replicating or scaling out um, your workloads and your infrastructure about multiple regions and multiple zones, for example. Um, vulnerability management, uh, as well as patch management, containers can have vulnerabilities and libraries can have vulnerabilities. So we have to continuously scan these vulnerabilities and scan these containers and scan your uh, code repository for these um, vulnerabilities and then mitigate this. Threat hunting. This is um, interesting because the cost at the moment for threat hunting, so we're talking about CM and SOC right now here, um, are really high if you do it in the cloud because a lot of data and um, the costs per gigabyte are really high. Though this is kind of a nice scenario for a hybrid cloud. You're running your CM and your SOC offline and kind of offline in your data center and transferring all the cloud data to your on-prem and then doing their um, the threat hunting and the um, CM and SOC stuff. Same goes for if you have your CM and SOC really good in place, same goes for incident response. And also I have to say there, um, we see in the technical operating model and I had a customer last year, they had three people in um, doing management of the CM. And that was quite less at this moment for the on-prem stuff, but they decided they don't want to do cloud. And there are two options then. You have a cloud CM team and implement it, which increases the people, or you have separate teams and separate responsibilities. There was a big problem to decide who is responsible for what, where is the, um, where the connection or where they differentiate these teams and what's with uh, IPsec panels between cloud and data center who is watching this. Um, and the other option was increasing the CM team and uh, around three schooled people doing cloud um, CM and threat hunting and they centrally manage it. And, this was the best solution, and we also got uh, at this comes to customer uh, go go this route because it was really easy and it was centralized again. So I think I have to give a little bit of the speed, um, but I think we are quite near the end right now because we have the optimization or the optimized phase. Um, we talked a lot about the upfront, the design, builds, and run. And the optimize is quite easy 
because you have to be, repeat all the steps again and again. You can go back from, if you have a running cloud, to the upfront question, have I done all this correctly? Have I all the skills? Have I all, all the know-how in my company? Can everything be done inside my company? Or have I get some new personal or have us to school my, my employees uh, to do the work. But you don't have to do it blindfolded. You have to do this observability very carefully. You have to uh, monitor closely your infrastructure, your workloads, and of course, the security. And I think Isan will tell you about this monitoring of security in cloud in, in a few moments. Um, now we have to do, I have to do a shameless plug because we as Karmasec have also a sort of service for that. Uh, we call it security champion as a service. Um, and all I talked about all the different knowledge and the different phases and the different operating models uh, I've, I've seen in the last years. And uh, I have helped my customers to decide the right operating model and the right tools and features. And uh, this is the service we, we are offering right now. We are supporting um, your cloud and DevOps teams um, with security experts from KarmaSec. We can all, uh, answering all your secu uh, security related questions. You can uh, help understand the security requirements because a lot of times there's also a problem what the CISO writes and what the people understand or the employees understand are different things. And of course, we uh, help support by the implementation of these, for example, pipelines or the cloud infrastructure itself and help writing Terraform code and policy as code and stuff like that. And that concludes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. And then back to Ethan.